Hot Sporting today. I'm with Arjun Tullywell from InvestorKit and we're going to be talking about some of the elements of property investing and the, the factors that separate the 1%, the those who achieve a property portfolio, from those who do not. So Arjun, you, with your business, you help people find investment properties, but you're also obviously a property investor in your own right. Um, can you remember that first one and where it was and how much you paid and do you still own it? Yeah, so the first one actually, uh, first property I purchased was the home, a uh, family home that we're all living in. And uh, that's no longer owned because that's actually been a place that we sold to upgrade. And yeah. today we're living in the outer rings of Sydney uh, on acreage. But one thing that's really been special is when I first purchased that home, the idea was to have all our family together. Yeah. And today uh, that has become a reality. So like through property investing, today's reality of having my whole family come together under one roof's happened, but that was the first property and it was the same concept, but just on much smaller, smaller land and smaller house. So when you say the whole family, is that the wider family? Yeah, so there's 11 of us now, Terry. It's okay. just unreal. Uh, me, my wife, my daughter, my brother, his partner and son, I think I'm getting my numbers right, uh, dad, stepmom, stepsister, mother-in-law, sister-in-law, that's 11. If you want to chuck in two dogs, 13. Holy moly, <laughs> clearly you're on acreage. It's, yeah. it's like the family estate. Yeah, all that we need is a little bit of drama thrown in and uh, we could start a reality show. But what right could, now we're no drama. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> but, but what you're saying is your success with um, your property business and with property investment has put you in a position where you can actually provide this property for... Absolutely. It started and I revisit that first property question you bring because the sale of my first property and the next door property which I owned as well, those two property sales funded the deposit for this purchase. Yeah. which means nine years ago, had I not started the journey of buying property and, and investing in real estate, this dream of today wouldn't have been possible. So definitely property investing has been a big key part of it. Okay, so a bit of time has passed since that first purchase and where you've got to now. What's been the philosophy that you've applied to your property investment that's got to you to this point? Yeah, this is one metric that started this philosophy for me. And this one metric for me is the most important one. It's the fact that 90% of all local government areas in Australia over the last 25 years have achieved 5% plus of compounding growth. This was based on core logic data. And the biggest learning for that start of the philosophy that if you're buying a house and it's in 90% of Australia, you're probably going to be okay long term. So once I learned that, it was a matter of just actually turning it into more formulas. And by formulas, I'm not getting any fancy research here. I'm just focusing on the formulas of investing to begin with. This is the philosophy piece. If I had certain dollars under my belt in compounding value, I took this worst case of compounding effects in long-term history across 90% of Australia, I could then chuck into tools and calculators where I think I'm going to be in the later years of life. Whilst no number's perfect in its exact equation, trusting 25 years of data actually helps. Hmm. And so this philosophy started for me that I'm going to go down the buy and hold path. I'm going to trust that long-term property investing is right here. And then I'm just going to get better at short-term decisions. And that was the core philosophy from the okay. start. So you've just partly answered my next question, which is now some people try to trade their way to success, buy, sell from, for a profit, buy something better. Um, but what you've articulated is, is buy and hold, buy good assets and keep them. That's your philosophy? Yeah, and you actually just touched on a really good point. Because of all the different ways to do it, it makes coming up with a philosophy, like if you, if you think too simply, sometimes people can think you're doing it wrong. Yeah. And so as a result of me having it that simple, uh, sometimes people are like, well, what if you subdivided? Or what if you chuck on an extra bedroom? Or what if you chuck on a room? Like, I'm here to tell you, like, Terry, 17 properties later, none of my properties have development potential. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing if you went and got it. Hmm. But I'm trying to say sometimes, if you don't want to take on those risks, or you don't want it to be that difficult, or you don't want too many barriers in front of you, that makes your decision paralysis by analysis come into play. Yeah. It is as easy as long-term hold, but what you can do is benefit your short-term decision-making through research, through technology, through improvements in just your mindset as an investor. But for me, coming back to that philosophy piece, 
it really is that. It is as simple as knowing that long-term buy and holds in Australia will do you well, and then it's just taking a step back to make the short-term better. Of course, that doesn't mean you can make foolish decisions. You want to maximise your opportunities of that, um, doing perhaps better than that 5% compound average if you choose your location and your property well and buy it at the right price, etc. Absolutely. Now that you know that the long term is okay, that should be your mission. Like knowing that you can make the de decision and you are going to be okay is the first step to decision making because that's where most people don't make the decision. They question so much of what's going to happen in the world, what's going to happen here locally, whether it's one of the political environments, the interest rate environments, their own job, or whether it's the neighbor next door of the property they might buy and they might be looking over the fence a bit too often and that holds them back. But the truth is, once you know the long term, you nailed it, you should be then focusing on short term because now it's here to make better decisions. Okay, so this, the stats tell us that um, most people own investment properties only own one or maybe two. Yeah. Not many people get to five or more. Um, why do you think that is? What's holding people back? So I think there's a few things. Uh, the first part is that when I think of our own decision making and where, it's, where it could have been, it could have been better. I actually think of this little joke that I saw over the weekend and it was a photo of a baby. And this photo of this baby above it said, um, here in 1998, wasting time not buying real estate. <laughs> the baby's probably like a three months old or two months old. Okay. And so the first thing is uh, paralysis by analysis, right? Um, there is great depth of analysis that should take place in every decision to buy real estate. But I haven't met an investor yet who said, I'm really glad I started later in life. Everything, even me at the young age of 22 of our first purchase, could I have found a way to get it done in 19 or 20? And it sounds silly, but that's the first part, is that if you really can bring it earlier, your chances of success longer term that allow you to get to the one to two to three, you've solved one core part of it, which is compounding values to fund your deposit. Now, going back to the next part, the first one is the toughest. So I do think that there is an element of discipline in household habits that had to happen. Like my partner and I who you know, were on the journey together, she and I had savings habits where we used to play games with savings. We used to try gamified a little. And that used to be the 40-50-40-50 rule. And I look at that rule now and go, how did we do that? That was some madness. And what that was was 40% of your net you put away. And once you achieve that, you get towards 50% of your net as the next target. And once you achieve that, 40% of your gross income, then once you achieve that, 50% of your gross income. Just put it this way, Terry, I can remember moments when me and her were laughing about that one big slab of frozen chicken that we used to cut up into pieces, throw it into the freezer, and keep reheating it with a bit of rice on the side. There were moments where we did that. There were moments where we were like celebrating that domino special that we had. All I'm saying is it takes a bit of sound money management and sacrifices to get the first one right and potentially the second. But after that, time is your friend and things start compounding. Um, from there, I think some of the other things that I feel hold people back is investing in you. Many people look at property investing as a way of freedom from everything they hate in life. And I often think like too often people put property investing as this escape tool from hate rather than going, wait, hold on a minute, can't we first focus on having a life that you love, doing something that you probably enjoy a little bit more first, and then have property investing as an additional tool rather than this escape tool? And because yeah. of this escape tool, people then end up making decisions that put them in the wrong traps. People end up uh, overthinking every decision because each decision is their home run rather than a journey to that home run. And these things mean that people aren't investing in that important part that's themselves, money habits, financial habits, career growth and success, business growth and success, all of these things are integrated. Too often property investing gets chucked into the, hey, this is shares and it's just about how much money you throw in, let the system tell you what it is. Well, no, it's a combination of what you need to do to grow income, your financial habits, because very few people around Australia can just go around buying properties one to 10 in cash all the time. There's an element of the bank needed, so to play the bank game, you need to understand your personal side of things, your income, your savings. So these are kind of the core reasons I've thought of when it comes to actually getting across multiple properties. Sure, there's performance on the more micro level, which is a critical part too, but it starts here on the mindset, savings habits, and, and so forth. Okay. Another one that um, occurs to me, which I see, I think, 
almost daily, and that's the reluctance of people to invest in advice and information. They're willing to take a loan, buy a big chunk of real estate, but not actually willing to spend relatively small amounts of money on making sure they get that decision right by engaging an investment advisor, a buyer's agent, an accountant. Uh, yeah, what you touch on though, I think, I think it's not just a property phenomenon, it's in life in general. Mm. Uh, I think of it as uh, how many times do I botch up that kitchen attempt at trying to make some decent dish versus I could have had the recipe, could have learned from someone, could have gotten it right. So even to small aspects of life, people want to have that pride or self-confidence to give things a go. And look, I think that's a great trait to have in some elements, but I've quantified that many times over both personally across aspects of life and professionally. And the, it, it's against you more than it's in your favor when you do those decisions. I think of it the same way in business. How many businesses succeed in the first couple of years? How many businesses continue to succeed over five years? How many businesses continue to succeed over 10 years? Like the numbers get smaller and smaller the more you stretch this curve. And then I ask myself in business, how many get education? How many have mentors? How many have true guidance? How many have coaches? How many actually invest in their business in marketing? How many invest in their business in you know, learning in systems and processes and consultants? And you could ask a lot of small businesses across the country and the same issues, very much the same, the same there. So I think firstly, it's more of a common thing in just how we are as humans, that we sometimes feel like we're meant to know everything ourselves. Uh, sometimes we feel like we should be a lot easier than it actually is. And then goes on to the decisions of not having professionals. But the main thing is like anything in life, if you do it a hundred times over, a thousand times over, versus one time every few years, or maybe even one time in your life, someone else who does that many times over is likely to be better than you doing it once. And that's where professional guidance and anything comes in. Yeah, so part of our philosophy is build your team, then build your portfolio. Is that something that you bring to your business as well? Absolutely, I think uh, the main thing is recognizing that team has allowed me to have sounding boards and questions. And I think of it the same way in my business mentorship, like the power of me being able to pick up the phone, jump on Zooms, email people, have community catch-ups, be a part of a community, have the right team surrounding me in business, has allowed us to have the growth that we're having. And why not take a page of that book, not from me in business, but many people in business who follow that same pathway and apply it to life personally. At the end of the day, property investing is a financial decision and finance and business are, are neck and neck or hand in hand with each other. So I think from that perspective, yes, building a team has to come first. And then from there, it's actually a lot easier because now 10 decisions might come down to two with the right people around you. Yeah. So mentoring is important, isn't it? Um, you mentor people, you have mentors. Presumably your mentors have mentors. Yeah. I mean, it just keeps going up the chain. But um, smart people um, never stop wanting to learn. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, you just made me think of a point of mentorship, though, which is something that, like, it, it also reminds me of sports. Just when you think you can run fast, there's someone who can run faster. Just when you can throw the ball hard, someone can throw it harder. So just realize that first part that you're not the best at probably anything and everything you do is so humbling to realize that someone else can then add value to that life or that aspect of life that you wanted in. The same thing with them. That person teaching you is probably not the best at what they do and someone else is teaching them. So it just actually is a never ending chain. And I always think to myself if that uh, somewhere I wanna be, that person is getting guidance from someone else. Who am I to think that I'm in a position to nail and know everything myself? Hmm. Yeah, I think um, you're on a slippery slope when you get to the point where you think you know it all <laughs> with property investment or anything else. Yeah, yeah, I think, Terry, like with property investing, you, you know this as well from your side, no matter how many years of experience build up, and today I just mentioned the figure nine of investing and just realized to myself, holy crap, it's been, it's been nine years. Well. Even if that figure was 20 or 30, there would still be something new on a chart, on a location, or something that comes up. It doesn't need to change my methodology, but it gives me something new to learn about that may have an impact that I didn't want to think had an impact. And I feel like that means that you know, forever we're learning, and you know, there's a saying, uh, ABL, always be learning. And I think that's, that's really important in today's world. Yeah. So you've told us your story about how that first purchase has helped you get to this most recent one, 
Um, but it seems to me that a lot of people never get beyond maybe one or two properties because they don't get the first one right. How important is it to get that first investment purchase right? Yeah, the first investment purchase, I often find, I'm going to be a little bit the opposite to what most people say. It's really interesting because the people that we've been able to scale the portfolios the most for actually got their first purchase wrong. Yeah. So there might be something in that. Do you know what I mean? A part of me thinks like, yes, getting your first one right is really important, but then if you self-confidently think it's right, and may, may not be, by the way, you may go down a pathway of thinking that you're going to make the second just like the first, the third just like the first, and the fourth if you get there, just like the first. So maybe getting that first one wrong has inspired people to realize they need to get some advice on board, so they've come to you and your team Absolutely. to not repeat the mistake. Absolutely. The highest frequency of clients that have gone on to build a very successful portfolio were investors that purchased, in our client base that is, that purchased a unit in Sydney or Melbourne between 2015 and 2018 that had little to no capital growth over the next five to 10 years or five to nine years to follow. Yeah. And as a result, felt that surely there's a better way to do this. And that's when they felt like, hey, I'm so submissive here that I really want to give you the keys. You go and do what we feel is the right moves to make and let's go make them together. And the beauty of that is that you get this truly open mindset of learning. And we've been able to have people then generate three properties, six properties, eight. And look, property metrics aside, let's not talk a quantity. Let's even just talk about compounding wealth, two, three, four, five million and beyond that then goes on to help them hit their long term goals. So one thing I learned is, was my first purchase perfect? Well, yes, it helped me today because I think the long term of property is very forgiving. But my first purchase was not perfect. The elements that were the downside was that it was a battle axe. And I learned that the battle axes will have a little bit of an impact in resale value. And so, yes, you need to purchase them right in price to connect with the resale percentages of the suburb. Otherwise, if you're paying higher dollars and you think that you're selling it in line with the rest of the suburb, it's not going to sell for the line with the rest of the suburb. So these are the learnings that I had on the journey. But had I not had those learnings at the start, I wouldn't have been in a position to seek out better decision making, which then led me to better decision making in future decisions. Yeah. So I think there's learnings to be had that don't maybe feel bad if you got your first one wrong. You might seek more help if you got your first one wrong, which actually benefits all of us. Yeah. So, yeah. One of the features of this interview, Arjun, is that you keep answering my questions before I actually answer, ask them. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask you this question, even though you've already answered, because it's on my list of questions. If you could go back to uh, and Tom, what advice would you give to the younger you? Mm. I've already shared a couple of tips, but I'm going to go give you a different, a different thing I'd say to myself. So there's the first part the battle axe. I tell my younger self, don't get a property in the battle axe. The second younger self one would be find a way to do it earlier, <laughs> even from 22. But the third one I do is I would say when I go back to that first purchase, it was me going back to grabbing a home and maximizing the budget I had for a place to live in because the bank told me I could borrow a million bucks. I wanted to go out all the way to a million bucks. And the learning in that for me is that I think I could have had a few more pieces on the chessboard in different areas to better diversify, to have better rental yields and affordable properties, to have more comfort in growing a portfolio that that would have allowed me to just have a bit better sleep at night, a little bit better comfort throughout, and probably an extra asset or two, in my opinion, had I not just gone and grabbed the biggest budget I could and throw it at the of the board with the best area I could for the biggest budget. So I often think that. So you kind of maximized your capacity with that one purchase and didn't you leave yourself a lot of wriggle room for the next one for a while? Yeah, there wasn't a strategy. I think the main thing was, it was, hey, what can I borrow? Great, where's the best we can get for, for this million bucks? And we went wherever the closest was to meet my family's requirements, my requirements, and get the best we could in that budget. There's great positives to you know, the lifestyle aspect that we ticked from that, but I don't think there's that strategic element that would make me say, oh, look, I know exactly where I'm heading, I know what I made this move for, I know why, and if I had my time again, I would have 
done that a bit better. Yeah. Well, I was surprised how many people I encounter with what we do who don't really have an end game. They haven't really thought it through. Where am I trying to get to? And therefore, what's my strategy for getting there? They just have a perhaps a vague notion that property investment is something they want to do. Uh, is that something that you, you're, you're finding in your business, that, that people need to yeah. be shown how to develop these steps? Yeah, it's definitely an element of I'm going in, I want the best one now, and I want as many of it as possible, and just see where it takes you. And then people are surprised that when they go through strategy mapping calls, they realize that, hey, between four and six properties seems to be the most common point in which people achieve a really healthy position for their long-term goals. Mm. And so I find that four to six, now you could divide that price into higher buckets, smaller buckets, and maybe make it three or four. But I mean, four to six is the most common part of affordable, great yielding, growth locations with a bit of diversity across states because uh, the tax persons or the tax people, the tax man, whatever you want to call it, is coming after you if you're just throwing it all in one state. So the main thing is this formula was really surprising to many people who came in and just felt, no, I'm just going to keep going because I heard someone else have 10, I heard someone else have 20, and uh, they were once my mate at school, so why can't I? And, or someone else going, I just want the best one now because that one singular property is going to solve all my life's problems. So it's just two extremes of yeah. one property solves everything or I need 20 to make a living. And that strategy conversation has been such an important point because people go, hey, I don't need that many and I don't need to take such aggressive decisions to hit home run on number one. I need to make the right decisions, improve decisions of what I could make personally need to have a measured approach and people are finding themselves that in three to six years they're getting their acquisitions under their belt. Uh, we've now been going for what, uh, coming to six years now, so we're starting to see the power of that all come together and people's plans not turning into just plans but actually fruition, like real, real things, real portfolios being built. And so I feel from that perspective that's been the biggest learning and I see that often as you're pointing out in clients where it's two extremes, a home run here or I need dozens. Okay, just to finish off, it um, seems to me that real estate abounds with myths and misconceptions about what works and the best places to buy perhaps. What are some of the common ones that you're, you're familiar with that you would like people to be aware of and not be misled by? The first one uh, comes from me and you having a similar background. When, you know, we're both Kiwis here in Australia and in New Zealand I don't recall there ever being this regional versus capital thing. It was just what city do you live in? I live in Auckland. Oh, what city do you live in? I live in Palmerston North. What city do you live in? I live in Nelson. Mm. Just the city name is what we call it. It's a city. Mm. You know, some cities have great pies. Some cities have great milkshakes. Some cities have great restaurants. Some cities have great views. A city's a city. We didn't really say that much. Mm. I think that's something that was humbling about being from New Zealand. Like we all kind of had smallish cities. So everything was just a city to us. Mm. And so as a result, when I came here, I learned about this whole capital regional thing. And I was like, that's weird, we don't, like yes, we've got capital cities, quote unquote, in New Zealand, but we don't talk about that in the same fashion. No. And so that thing made me realize that people genuinely believe that the capitals are this, you know, the bee's knees of, of property investing and that's the only place where you generate real and meaningful capital growth. That's not the case. You know, you can survey data. My first data point I released in this particular episode was, was me saying, hey, 90% of LGAs, including regional markets, achieve 5% or more compounding growth. So let's not put your one on a pedestal because it starts with the word capital in there. Uh, all cities go through booms, flat periods, and mild declines. And as a result, we need to just be prepared, whether it's a regional or capital, is more about what your budget is and what the best performing market is at that time. And I believed that when I was setting up my portfolio, I would invest, in my opinion, the best performing markets I could see at that time. And guess what? By chance, because of just simply aiming for that, half my portfolio is in regional city and half my portfolio is in capital cities. Mm. It wasn't because I felt one was better than the other. It was just because at the given time, I felt, why not just make the best decision you can? And that's what I give investors the insights on today. It's like, hey, at the given time, what is the best decision you can make? Knowing long-term property investing is okay, and knowing that we have you know, close to 50 cities with at least 20,000 plus in population, statistically significant, enough data out there to collect and make decisions, so enough long-term averages to show that you're gonna be okay. Make the best short-term decision today. Don't let the myth of these two words sitting in front of the word city think that they dictate performance. 
great way to end. Thank you, Arjun. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.